You must stay at home. Stay at home. Hello and welcome to Lockdown, hosted by Steve Bonford with Mike Davis-Marks. Our armed forces operate in challenging environments. Week by week, we'll explore what we can learn from their experiences. Hi, Steve. I hear you've just interviewed the National Servicewoman of the Year. And MBE. Yes, Bex Fines. Yeah, I understand she's a, a leading writer in the Navy, and we can explain what that is after the interview. Uh, but I'm looking forward to hearing her story. Yeah, it's a fantastic story. I think you're going to enjoy this one. First of all, Bex, I'd like to say thank you very much for, for coming onto the podcast. And also, congratulations for being awarded, if that's the right phrase, Naval Service Woman of the Year. Thank you very much for having me, Steve. Um, I'm so blown away, actually, by having that nomination. Really, really happy about that. How, do, how did that come about? How, what, what, what's the process for that? Because I didn't know anything about it until you mentioned it to me. So, uh... <laughs> Well, last year was the first ever um, award given and at a really, really fancy conference, which was awesome in Yeovil. And Princess Anne was there and I got to meet her. And um, I got an email a few months ago saying that I'd been nominated for an award. And um, they said, if you don't hear anything back by next week, then um, you, you won't have the award. And I didn't hear anything back. And I thought, OK, so somebody else has got in, you know, I'm really I don't mind. I've had a few awards. And um, and then I, yeah, I had a, I had a knock at the door and a, a plate presented to me with some flowers and some champagne and. I was over the moon. I'm really, really excited, really happy, um, and yeah, really honoured as well. Congratulations again. Very, very well done. It's just a shame about the fancy award ceremony not happening this year because obviously of COVID. <laughs> exactly. It was all virtual, and I did get dolled up when I dressed and you know did my hair and makeup. First time in ages, actually, and it was a one-way uh, virtual conference. So uh, <laughs> the boys liked me getting dressed up, of course, which was really good. I've got another one um, at the weekend, Women in Defence Awards. I haven't been nominated for any awards, but I'm really, really pleased to be invited as um, one of the VIPs to attend. So that's really good. It is indeed. Well done. So let's let's carry on with talking about yourself. So I've got some questions for you. I will start with. So since joining the Royal Navy, you and your family have been on quite a journey. Can you tell me about that? And this is obviously part of the reasons why you've been nominated, I suspect. Yes, yes. So... Um... Around 2007, I joined the Navy. But before that, I'd done a bit of travelling, worked in HR, got a bit bored of uh, being a civvy, if I'm honest, and uh, did my training, joined my first ship, and that's where I met my husband, Mike, who's a stoker. And, um, yeah, we were best friends for a few years before we got together, and then we decided to have children. And um, Sebby, well, we got pregnant with Sebby. Um, we'd been on quite a difficult journey before then. We'd already had three miscarriages before then and uh, it was at the 12 week scan when um, as you can imagine by this stage the pregnancy because of what I've been through I was already quite nervous with everything and at the 12 week scan it took ages to find baby and then they had to measure everything and then they uh, they told me that we had a one in two chance of our baby having Down syndrome so they took us into the what we call the room of doom <laughs> And um, yeah, so we sat in there and the, the practitioners told us that because we had a one in two chance of having a baby with DS, um, it might not survive, might self-terminate, might be born with severe disabilities. Um, and um, we could either choose to have it terminated or get it adopted. I wasn't in the best place, actually, from that, um, from them telling me that our baby was going to be born with Down syndrome. We uh, dealt with it very differently, my husband and I. That weekend, I went away and did all the research under the sun, you know, looked at YouTube videos. I contacted the local organisation, the local support group, who were fab. And um, my husband didn't deal with it at all. He, um, he just said, I'll deal with it when it's born. You know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So there's no point in worrying about it until then. And uh, yeah, so Sebi was born with Down syndrome eight weeks prematurely he was born at 32 weeks 
And we didn't have any amniocentesis, which is the test where they put the really long needle into your womb. We didn't have that because of the increased risk of miscarriage. And uh, so when Sebi was born, I could obviously see it straight away. And that was when it hit my husband in the face, like a plank of wood. There it was, you have a baby with a disability. Um, so he was in shock for quite a while. And I just, you know, I was loving my baby. He was early, so he was whisked off to uh, NICU straight away. But um, yeah, I mean, th that's when things really just changed, I think, for the both of us. Life, it changes anyway when you're a parent, doesn't it? Yep, yep. And uh, yeah, it, it was opening our eyes to a lot of things, how they treated us, because I was put in separate rooms. So I woke up without my baby. He was in NICU, which I found really odd. And uh, because he was prem, he needed lots and lots of attention. And the hospital only gave me a little booklet about Down syndrome and what it was. And it, it looked really outdated. And, you know, when you feel like you're getting those sorts of looks, oh, I, you know, I don't really know what to say to her and, and all that, all those sorts of feelings and emotions. And, and I thought that what I'd like to do is to use our journey and put it into something good and turn it around. So from, from day one, basically, when Sebi was diagnosed, I was already planning things in my little notebook about how I was going to change the future. <laughs> Just like that. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I like the attitude, the positive attitude. That's really good. So I can't say I'm an expert on this subject, but what is Down syndrome? What, what, what are we talking about here? So Down syndrome is when an individual has three copies of chromosome 21. So a typical person has 46 chromosomes and you get some additional syndromes where you have extra chromosomes. And obviously Down syndrome is three copies of chromosome 21. And that's where the World Down Syndrome Day comes from, the 21st of March. And uh, it's a very big day our community get together basically to raise awareness. So people that have never been in contact with anybody that has Down syndrome, we tell them about it. You know, it's not something to be scared of. They are a little bit different. Um, but with the right care and nourishment, then they can thrive mm. and they can be awesome. I did read, actually, whilst doing some research for this, about the massive increase in life expectancy of people with Downs, which has changed enormously, hasn't it, over the last few, well, probably the past 20 or 30 years? It has. But as recently as the 90s, people were still put in institutions yeah. away from their parents because that was believed that it was the best thing to do. Some In some countries, foreign countries, still they do that. Um, but with the right support, as I say, and we've been involved with Portsmouth Down Syndrome all the way along, and they've done some amazing work to encourage people in the community to accept um, people with Down Syndrome, but people with disabilities and differences in general. Um, and, you know, it's nice to say that Sebi is he's eight years old now and he goes to a mainstream school. He has lots of support there. But, you know, he's grown up with his friends and it's really, really refreshing to see. Fantastic. So I think it's fair to say Sebi has changed your life in more than one way. He has. Yes, he has. So a little bit about what happened to me. Um, when Sebi was born, we, we said to the Navy that, you know, our, our son has a disability. I applied for a career break. I had three years off. Uh, little did I know that I wasn't going to sit around for three years and be a mum. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. That that's an amazing job, but I just I just needed something else. So I decided to get involved with the local support group, the Portsmouth Down Syndrome Association. I first started off doing some administration for them, and um, then I became a trustee, which was a really really proud time for me. Um, and during my time with them, I think I was with them five or six years. I took the role of trustee, secretary for a time being, and new parent liaison. During my time with the Portsmouth DSA, I uh, got involved with fundraising. I organised an ab sale of Spinnaker Tower, skydive, raised up to about £50,000 with the help of lots of other people. Um, I regularly spoke at council training events um i went to colleges just because you know everybody that i knew i um just said do you want me to come speak to your students do you want me mm. to come speak to your school i really really love to just let you 
know about some things about DS, you know, just teach you. Bring Sebi in, show you that he's nothing to be scared of. He's just an adorable little boy. So I did I did lots with the Portsmouth Down Syndrome Association. And one of my proudest things that I did do with them was um, I took on the role of new parent liaison. So when somebody would have a diagnosis, they'd contact the charity and I'd try and mentor them through their pregnancy, um, which was a, a really, really good time for me. Um, hard because I had a few lessons to learn along the way, because although Sebi's turned out you know, with, with Down syndrome, there's no um, say how they're going to turn out. They could be born with heart conditions, other medical conditions, uh, hearing, sight, speech impediments, all these types of things. Um, and I, when I first started the job, I thought that they were all going to be like Sebi, the children when they're born. But, you know, no children are the same. So I had to learn a few hard things along the way. Um but yeah, really, really a good job doing that. And uh, it took up quite a lot of my time and I de designated a lot of time to the charity. Um, lots of fundraising, you know, going shaking buckets. We did the Great South Run every year. It was brilliant, really good community to be a part of. And then sadly, my career break came to an end. I had Ben, who's my youngest. He's now five, going on the 15, I think. <laughs> Little monkey that he is. And... Um, he came along and maternity leave was up, so I had to go back to work. And uh, again, I couldn't just go back to work. I was still very passionate about making a change and being very involved in Portsmouth Down Syndrome Association. So um, I remember one year for World Down Syndrome Day at uh, Navy Command HQ in Portsmouth, I organised a bake-off. So all these people brought in their cakes and an admiral got to taste the cakes and say which was the best. And uh, I think at that event, I raised about five or six hundred pounds. And it was from that bake sale. I was in the Navy news and, you know, it, all over the Navy social media. But it's from that bake sale. I received an email, which I've always remembered. You know, I never forget it. A warrant officer who was going through a similar thing. He was a carer. And um, he suggested that I get in touch with a lady called Major Mandy Islam, who was setting up a network in defence. And um, I thought, oh, you know, this sounds a really, really interesting thing to do. But I was a little bit worried at the time, if I'm honest. You know, I had two children, husband at sea, me in a full-time role. I was doing a voluntary job with the, a, a local charity and um, then taking on another voluntary role. <laughs> People always said to me, how did you do all that? How I many, don't know. How I many, really don't know. How many hours a day do you have? <laughs> it seems like twice as many um, as me. I used to log on when my boys were in bed and I used to send charity emails or during my lunch breaks. And yeah, I was just crazy for years, several years, really busy. Um, but it was it was good. It's what I needed, I think, at the time. So I got in touch with Major Randy Islam and um, she asked me to be an executive member of the Candid Network, which is the Chronic Conditions and Disability in Defence Network. So it was around June 18, and it was still growing at that time. Um, we launched our network in um, the RAF Club in London, which is a lovely, beautiful building. And there were lots of ministers there and very, very senior MOD officials. And um, I did a speech. It was a very, very good speech. I brought the room of about 80 people to tears, I think, with my, <laughs> with my story. Very powerful. Uh, it took me weeks to write my speech. And um, yeah, from then, I think because you're networking, your name gets out, people know who you are. I started to be linked to different networks, to the forces, federations, to service charities, to all sorts of places, which was really, really good. And I think the power of networks is so important. Uh, from the Candid Network, uh, out of that came the RN Disability sort of network or team, if you want to call it that, which is championed by Rear Admiral Paul Marshall. He came on board, very, very passionate about making a change. And uh, my sidekick was at the time Commander Kay Hallsworth. Uh, we bounced off each other and we taught each other so much. And during our time together, we, um, we organised a the first ever Royal Navy Disability Conference and uh, sort of like a stakeholders event. So we've got a few commanding offices in from local units. 
we use people's lived experiences we talk to them about carers about people with disabilities and severe illness you know what they go through taking them on our journey and just making them understand what it's like to be us Mm -hmm. and hopefully opening their eyes really so from all this work we've sort of shone a spotlight on disability and carers in the armed forces which has has just massively grown ever since I started um and it's not all just me and I'm not not saying it's just me the team the the other candid network executives they're all sort of got team from the army RAF and some civil servants as well and uh, we're all bouncing off each other we're all amazing uh people that have different experiences I think that's what helped us work so well uh, so, so the disability conference, um, yeah, I mean, I've, it, it's been awesome. It's been a really, really good few years. We've achieved so much, and people are talking out about disability when they weren't before. Mm. It was only yesterday there was um, a video on Twitter of the second Sea Lord talking about his neurodiversity, which you just, you know, you don't expect to see that. That's brilliant. He's putting himself out there, and we love to see that. People are talking about disability and about carers people are starting to open up I think in the caring community a lot of people don't class themselves as carers because they feel that it might affect their promotion or their drafts or their job you know when we join the Royal Navy or the Air Force or the Army we don't decide to become a carer it's forced upon us and we have to take on that role and um you know, I've been in 13, 14 years now, and I've been a lead in hand for 10 years. I have had a career break in that time, but I'm still a leading hand, a very frustrated leading hand. But I can understand why I'm still a leading hand, because I can't 100% designate my career and put my career first. You know, I've, I've got children, I've got caring responsibilities. My husband's in the Navy as well. So he needs to concentrate. We're going to concentrate on his career. And then when it's my turn, you know, I'll tell him to move over. I'm coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming up to take over. But um, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of things. And we understand, we understand why. Um, do you know, do you know, Bex, talking to you, I must admit, and doing a bit of research before we, we, we spoke, before we recorded this session, I was genuinely surprised at my own complete lack of knowledge. You know, I mean, obviously okay. we've talked and I think I think in some ways that's kind of what we're talking about, isn't it? Because immediately you sort of conjure up a mental image of someone with a disability, whatever disability is. And then all the kind of stereotypes immediately follow immediately behind yeah. that. And I think yeah. if you don't have any lived experience or know somebody who has lived experience, this is quite a difficult sub- subject to understand in the sense that what you're going through, what the individual's going through, the person with a disability and I think that's what I find very interesting about this. And you kind of managed to achieve all of that, raise awareness whilst, you know, working, yeah. having two children, husband at sea. I think all of that's quite, quite important. But I think the understanding of the experience is, is the difficult thing here for people that have no, can't relate to it. And I think that's kind of what's interesting about what you're talking about. Well, one of the things that's interesting about what you're talking about here. That's exactly correct. And that's what we're trying to do in defence is give people an understanding of what it's like to be in the shoes of a carer or somebody with a disability. When we when we first had our diagnosis that Sebi was going to be born with Down syndrome, I, I asked somebody, I spoke to them on the phone. So will he need to go to a special school? Will he need supportive equipment? Will he need this? And they said, no, no, you know, he, he probably won't need any of that. But straight away, you think disability and you see what you see, yeah. you know, what you've been brought up to see, what the news has told you to see, what TV's told you to see, all of those things. Um, and hopefully, I'll talk to anybody that will listen, but hopefully I've managed to share my lived experience with enough people for them to sort of say, now, you know, I, I actually know somebody with a child that has Down syndrome. After my um, coffee morning, just going back in NCHQ in 2018, so many people come up to me afterwards and said, my brother's got Down syndrome, my sister's got Down syndrome. And then from that point onwards, they would always smile at me and we'd have a chat. And it was just a way of bringing you closer together with somebody. And uh, we held a carers event in Navy Command HQ. Uh, we held a couple and um, it was for military and civil servants. And 
I looked at some of the people in the room and I thought, I've known you for years. Yeah. I walk through that door every day and I look at you and I say, good morning, but I did not know you were a carer. And that was the most powerful thing about networks. And that's why it's so inspiring. You know, it just, just gives that extra peer to peer support to people when they need it. I, I think, think I think that's really important because again, you, you obviously judge a person by you know, however you know them. You obviously don't know what's going on in their private lives, their family lives, but also the sheer number of people this affects. Because I'm sure I read somewhere that you know Portsmouth Carers Centre, which is not a big city in the grand scheme of things, has something like seven thousand members that people are involved in caring in some way, shape or form, and many of them obviously quite young as well. Um, and I think that's quite surprising. There's far is far more prevalent than people realise if you're able shall we say and if you're in that area so my sister is a carer her husband had a stroke a few years ago um and then before that she was a carer for my dad um i think at, at some point in your life you're going to care for somebody mm. but um just some stats taken off carers uk three million people in the uk juggle work with caring that's a huge number and how many of those people actually, will, um, you know, come out and say that they're a carer? I know my husband doesn't like to admit it because, yeah. you know, he he's he's a, a man. I don't want to say I'm not not sexist or anything, but but that's the sort of environment he works with. Lots of men, you know. The, um, well, a lot so of, he, he, a lot of that responsibility will fall on women, won't it? It does. It does tend to. I do know some really really good dads out there who mum goes to work and dad cares for the kids at home and it's it's brilliant it's you know however it works in your household um but yeah one in five carers give up so in my speech when we did the launch I said to everybody in the room I love being in the navy it is who I am but as soon as the navy doesn't support me to be a carer with flexibility compassion and understanding then I'll have to make that difficult choice between the Royal Navy and my son and, you know, it's going to be my son every time, mm. sadly. Um, but, yeah, let's work together. Let's open everybody's eyes and say, let's be a bit more flexible in certain environments because we are operational. We know we can't do that. But just ask your oppo, your, your, your friend, your colleague, how are you? Mm. Check in. Um, I know lots of carers that have a really tough time, but they come to work and they feel that they have to work so much harder than everyone else because they've got a point to prove. Yep. It's like they feel that they have to be there. They want to be there. So they have to work harder. And also people are so reluctant to ask for help. I think we, we exactly. nobody likes to, it's like, I mean, we talked about this before. There's, there was a sort of, there is a stigma with all of this, isn't it? And I think that's kind of what's driving people's behavior in some cases that you just don't feel like you should ask for help. It might be culturally, it could be any number of different reasons why people don't. But obviously, if you don't seek help, things are going to be a lot more difficult for you. Yes, definitely. And there is help out there. And a good thing about the Candid Network, we've got a Facebook page, um, Twitter page. We do offer peer-to-peer -peer support. We signpost people. So, for example, a really, really good thing is um, a company called King's Camp, King's Active. So it's a summer camp for military kids that they can go in the summer. Um, and um, it, it's been operating for a few years and I applied for SEBI a couple of years ago and was turned away first time and said, well, we can't look after him. We can't provide enough care for him. He needs a one to one. He needed somebody to help him change, somebody to make him, make sure he ate and drank. And, you know, he can't talk very well. So just make sure he was safe. And uh, we had to go away and find our own one to one, our own funding. Um, I, I asked all the service charities and for some, you know, red tape, they couldn't give us funding. There was just one service charity that came through in the end, which really, really helped us. And we had Sebi's one to one from school who's been brilliant and he's been with him every year. But because of that, because I pushed and pushed and pushed and I knew some of the right people to talk to. Sebi was able to attend that camp and be included as all the other kids. Now, how many more kids out there that are slightly different with a disability or something like that? And they're, they're not included. They're left out. And mum and dad don't have the fight or the willpower to keep putting up that fight for their kids. Mm. That's what course, I always worry about. I, I agree. And of course, those, shall we say, able children never get to see different children, to use your phrase, do they? And so that, that perpetuates the kind of stigma, doesn't it, when suddenly you encounter something new later on in life? 
Yeah, yeah. And so he, he goes to these camps and he just gets loved by all the kids and he laps it up. He loves all the extra attention and um, he gets so lazy sometimes. All the girls go, oh, so we can help you with your coat. Yeah, he can put his coat on himself. He just, you know, he loves the attention. But every time we drive past Temeraire, that's where they do the camp. He says, hockey, hockey. And he still loves it. And hopefully he's going to do it this summer with his brother, Ben, which will be awesome. But um, yeah, you know, there's lots of things out there that people don't know about necessarily. Mm. People at the top who are trying to reach out to all types of people Unless they know, people don't speak up. People are too scared to ask for help, as you say, or people yeah. are too scared to speak up. So that's kind of what I've done in the last few years. I've spoken to the right people and said, look, how about this? And what about this? Think about this person. Um, and there's still so much that we need to learn and a journey that we still need to go on, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you think SEBI has changed the Royal Navy? through all your tireless efforts how how has he affected the royal navy so so for example sebi straight away as soon as he was born he's given me a purpose to be his advocate and be his advocate and other people's advocates uh, i've met lots of people who who don't have the confidence to stand up for themselves or their children so um i've used that to advocate for people in the armed forces i've kind of got myself hopefully a little bit of a good reputation now people do come to me and ask me about service families how that how we can help them um they come to me for advice and assistance or just general support um which is really really nice i think and i feel privileged to be asked to do that but i think since Sebi was born, me being back at work and all the work that I've done with the RN disability team and the chronic conditions network, he he has helped me be confident to speak out for him and other people. And that's exactly what we've done. And things are changing for the better still. You know, the MOD are starting, well, they are very, very inclusive and they're starting to open more doors and look at things differently, which is it's what we need. Mm which has got to be a good thing because it's not historically how you visualize the armed forces at all, is it? It's not necessarily a, an organization you automatically assume with everybody being involved for lots of different reasons. And some of them sensible reasons, of course, because if you're obviously not able-bodied, you can't serve or easily serve. So that's, that's really, really good to hear. So it's not like you haven't achieved a lot so far. <laughs> <laughs> you're not that old. I don't know exactly how old, but you're not that old. Um, what do you else do you hope to achieve? What is there left to achieve for you? I don't know. You know, there's. I have achieved a lot. So um, obviously was nominated, awarded with, very graciously awarded with an MBE in October for my help with my work with um, inclusion and diversity in the MOD and um, the local uh, community, which was a great honour. Um, but yeah, to be happy, I think I'd like to slow down a bit. As I say, I've been working very hard over the past four or five years and I'm a bit tired. <laughs> um, so to have some children, to concentrate on me for a bit, to have to concentrate on my career, um, possibly to get promoted, I think. Is that, but is that, most is, of all... Is there anybody we need sorry. to address that specific comment to? Is there, who do we need to talk to? <laughs> Well, well, I'm, you know, we'll see what comes. We'll see what comes. Um, there's nobody that can speak to, unfortunately, I don't think, to get that to happen. But uh, it'll come when it's ready, I think. Um, but, yeah, to have a good work-life balance um, and to work for a armed forces that's inclusive and accepting and um, to work for a flexible, compassionate employer. I don't think anybody else would ask for much more. And to come out of lockdown, of course, of and get course. back to normal. <laughs> it's just as you were talking there, I was thinking about that. How has that? How has lockdown affected Sebi? Is that is that something he's aware of, or because obviously yeah, school obviously yeah, would have the stopped? Yeah, the first I lockdown, guess. he was shielding because he had pneumonia a few years ago, <clears throat> and um, he was very poorly in hospital, and he was shielding, and he didn't go to school, and he really suffered being out of a routine. So the second lockdown, we kept him in school full time because he's got an educational health care plan. And that really helped him. But his brother, who was a typical de typically developing child, really struggled. He was only in school for two days a week. 
and he really struggled. So I think this lockdown period has really affected children, young children mm. especially. Mm. But there are lots of different children out there with additional needs that have been able to go to school, that haven't been able to go to school. It's been really difficult for parents as well because they've been, they're trying to manage work and the guilt that you have to decide between work and your child, it's, it's heavy. And as soon as Ben went back to school for full time, I felt that guilt lift off my shoulders. Now I just have to concentrate on work mm. from eight till four, Monday to Friday. And I'm really happy about that. So my, I take my hat off to the amount of parents that have been working at home whilst home educating children. It's, it's been tough. I'm not going to lie. No, it can't be easy, can it? Let's hope these vaccines all work and we can get to some, yes. sort, some sort of normality. You mentioned um, World Downs Syndrome is on the 21st of March, um, which is not too far away now. How do people get involved in that? What could they do? So we have something called lots of socks. So from yesterday, our whole community are wearing odd socks. You walk around the odd socks and people say, why have you got odd socks on? Well, the chromosome 21-3 represents the odd socks for some reason. Um, One year I got the spinnaker tower lit up, which was really, really good. We do have lots of awareness events going on so cake sales in a typical world I would give an assembly to my son's schools and the kids still see me around the street oh you came and spoke in our school about Sebi yes I did I you know I'll, I'll do anything to raise awareness but there's lots of amazing things going on raffles the only the other day I won a kilogram of sweets I'm really happy about receiving that <laughs> um but it's a chance to get involved with the local community. We've got the mayor tweeted the other day with his odd socks. Um, and we've got some really, really great celebrities on side as well. It's just about raising awareness for us all over the world. So are we asking, or are you asking rather, people to show, take pictures of their odd socks? Is this how can people can get involved on social media? Is we that a thing? are, yes. We're asking people to take pictures of their odd socks. And it's going on our Facebook, Portsmouth DSA, a Facebook page and Twitter page. And um, as I say, there's a raffle and there's lots and lots of awareness campaigns going on. I think there's a prize for the best odd socks as well. I'm not really allowed to, but I'm going to send my son in to school with odd socks on. The, the craziest socks every day for the next week. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. So with, with all those, um, you've mentioned a few Facebook pages, websites, all this kind of stuff. If you send that through to us, we can post that into the description of the podcast. So do. for our listeners that want to find out more, that will be available in the description of the podcast. I'd like to say thank you so much for agreeing to do this. It's been absolutely fascinating. I have learned an awful lot that I didn't know prior to, to meeting you, Beck. So you've, you've achieved something else, albeit very small in the grand scheme of things. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank thank you, you for coming on. Thank you for having me. And just, um, yeah, I feel totally honoured to be part of this because you've had some pretty inspirational people on board. So thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, Mike, that was an amazing story, wasn't it? So much in such a short space of time, I think. Absolutely. I was taken by a statement she said right at the very end, which was that she'd listened to the podcast and she was pretty inspired by the people that we'd had that you'd had on it before now. And I was just thinking, but you're one of them, Bex. Actually, you're one of the most inspiring people we've had. Yeah, you're fantastic. I thought she was talking about us. Well, let's 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 be realistic here. Me possibly, but you? No. Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. Uh, I know. I thought, wow, what a fantastic person. Um, I can see why she won National Service Woman of the Year in only its second year of running. I can see why she was awarded an MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2020. And she's all she's done that as a leading writer in the Royal Navy. And, and I'm not sure if all your listeners know what a leading writer is, but they're kind of the backbone of the Navy. So um, we use the term writer to mean uh, admin administration clerk. Um, They do everything that makes a service function, all the HR functions, payroll, pension, everything. Uh, Everything that makes, you know, the glue that holds the whole bit together is done by the the writing branch um, or the admin branch. Um, And she's a leading writer, which means that she's the equivalent of a corporal. So she's a a superior officer under Queen's regulations for the Royal Navy. um, so it's a lot of responsibility for someone that's relatively junior 
um but we can't we couldn't exist without them no um and doing all of that of course she's had a career break she's had a young family her husband is i guess frequently deployed as well so yeah that's that's a lot to achieve get with everything else that's going on what was really interesting is um you know when she she talks about sebi um and being aware that sebi might be down syndrome before uh, he was born uh, how she dealt with that, how her husband didn't deal with that. Um, I thought, uh, what a remarkable person to say, actually, this is a possibility. I'm going to start planning for it just in case it happens. And w when it happened, although she probably wasn't, you would never be fully prepared for things like that, she mentally was adjusted to the fact that this might be the case. And it didn't seem that she she took a, um, hesitated a step at all in terms of dealing with it. Um perhaps unlike her husband, I might be slightly unfair there, uh, but um, what a fantastic way that she dealt with it. And then then to use that as a platform to, you know, uh, help other people in similar situations. Um, she talked about the Portsmouth Down, Down Syndrome Society, which she became a, um, um, a member of, and then a trustee of, and then the secretary of, and then she talked about fundraising, I, you know, abseiling down Spinnaker Towns. You didn't ask much about that, by the way. You could have done. Um, and then mentoring new parents um, in, you know, that were faced with Down syndrome babies themselves. Extraordinary, really. I didn't ask about the Spinnaker Tower abseiling because I was I was thinking I might ask you if you'd like to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure Spinnaker Tower's got enough strength, um, uh, vertical strength to make... make to um, we stole me haps handing down it. We're, we're, so don't even go there, please. Um, the other thing, I mean, you, I think it was for you, and I definitely for me. There was quite a lot of learning about stuff we'd never thought about before. Um, and I suppose you don't think about it if you're not, you don't if you haven't had some experience either directly or indirectly through friends and family, uh, which I have had very little. Uh, but um, we learnt, I think, that the twenty first of March which has just passed when this um, podcast goes out to broadcast, is World Down Syndrome Day. How about that? It was very ser serendipitous and a good coincidence. I must admit, I'm taking about on your point about learning a lot. I think there's an element, you know, when you think people are going through some difficulties in life, whatever they may be, you're afraid to ask or you think you might ask a stupid question or it might come across as being, you know, a bit ignorant, if you know what I mean. So it was fascinating to have someone who you could talk to or I could talk to and actually ask questions that I would, might ordinarily not be asking. Absolutely. Um, she raised that whole issue about people not knowing how to talk about disability. Um, and there's a and there's a famous poster I remember seeing on the London Underground, which is which is a person with a hole through them. And, and the caption says, please don't look through me. Um, and I think that's very true. People find it quite difficult to talk about disability. And and, I, and and she's talking about that's changing. People uh, are starting to be much more upfront about it, um, both whether they've got a disability, and she spoke about the second Sea Lord came out recently to talk about uh, an aspect of autism that's in his DNA, which uh, is incredibly brave. He's a Samariner, by the way, so one of the chosen ones. We're, we're all probably somewhere on the autistic spectrum. Um, but um, I, I, I think that, that she's done an awful lot to get people talking about a subject that is quite difficult for people that had no experience of it and i think that's that's one of the real achievements that she's done absolutely and encouraging people to come forward as well because as she said there are many people serving who have who have family members immediate family members that might be going through some of these difficulties who are still even at this day reluctant to come forward and seek help when it is available for them indeed um it's that old phrase you don't know what you don't know and you know and actually she talked about you know since she got into networking networks and meeting other people in similar situations she 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 talked about meeting people she'd known for some time and actually thought she knew quite well but didn't know that they were a carer for someone that was disabled and and i think that's true of all of us we probably you know have this peripheral vision that we of a lot of people we know that we don't know that much about in terms of things like this yeah i think that thing about caring is quite interesting because it, i think it's it's true to say that a lot of people just do this because it's the right thing to do and don't necessarily recognize themselves as carers or and as we've just said get the support they may be entitled to from wherever it may come. Yeah. 
she also talks about stereotypes you know they, you know we, we we put all people with disability into a box and stereotype them and actually that's not true uh, and actually we 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 talk about you know, disability is something as people that can't do things. And I think the language needs to change. I think the language needs to be about what you can do, not what you can't do. Let's talk about what people can do. And therefore, it, it, the disability, you know, doesn't become a barrier. But it just shows you what, you know, is the art of the possible. Um, and a lot of people with disability can do things better uh, than able-bodied people. I, I'm, As you probably know, I used to be involved in inter-service skiing, and some of the particularly raw marines that used to come down um that would that had no legs used to come down on sit skis um could ski much better than i could on two legs um and i wasn't ashamed to admit it yeah and that was before the glue vine <laughs> i think um i mean the paralympics it's not paralympics is an obvious example there isn't it of how people can achieve extraordinary things and many of our guests of course have been become disabled through circumstances beyond their control and the way they've responded i think it's important to have these kind of conversations because it affects many many people in all walks of life so you'll be pleased to know that i am wearing spotty socks um in honor of this uh, uh, interview and i shall be wearing them on sunday for for World uh, Down Syndrome Day as well, although most of my socks are spotty, so that won't be too difficult in my case. For our listeners' benefit, I've already had the pleasure of Mike shoving his feet up in the camera. Um, it's not a pretty sight at the best of times, but I can confirm the socks are spotty. Fortunately, there's no smell sensors in our computer link-up, but that's good. Um, she talked about sense of purpose, Steve, and this is a recurring theme in all of the podcasts about the sense of purpose. And and she said how her sense of purpose changed when Sebi was born. And and it became, to, it was to be his advocate, she said. That was my, my sense of purpose changed, and, I, and to be his advocate. I thought that was very powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also, it's manifest in Sebi, isn't it? Because he's, you know, in a normal school, if that's the right phrase, you know, he's, he's with other children his own age, that there's no sort of special circumstances given to him, although he has support whilst at school. And I think things like that are great to hear. Absolutely great to hear. Yeah, so do I. So, I mean, what a wonderful, authentic, absolutely um, inspiring person uh, that, you know, is a leading writer in the Royal Navy, a serving leading writer in the Royal Navy. And so I've got one plea for anyone that's listening here, particularly Second Sea Lord, if you're tuned in. Um she's still a leading writer after I think she said 10 years um if she's not capable of inspiring and leading people through what she's done as a petty officer and beyond I don't know what is she should be promoted not because she's not ticked all the right boxes in her career task book but because she's capable of leading and inspiring probably better than a lot of people senior to her so uh, waste not a day please and get her promoted straight away i i think the royal navy would look so much better uh with petty officer fines rather than leading writer fines i couldn't agree more you need to make that happen mike if you've still got that kind of influence yeah, i absolutely don't but i'm hoping that somebody might be listening to this that does second sea lord you've been named i feel a tweet coming on <laughs> That was that was a fascinating conversation, wasn't it? Thank you very much for that, Mike. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. The Royal Navy and Royal Marines charity exists to support sailors, marines and their families for life. If you or someone you know could do with some support, give them a call on 023 93 87 1568 or drop them an email on support at rnrmc.org.uk. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to hear more, please subscribe. <laughs>